Uh, meniscus. So meniscus, that's it. It should be knee jerk. This is the best one. Sensitivity and specificity is actually really good. Patient's going to be standing, and you're always going to start with the good leg. I would, I would suggest, in general, when you're doing orthopedic tests, start with the side that's not painful or injured or things like that, just so you get a, you get a good baseline. Meniscus, it's really important to get a good baseline because they might have a little bit of pain with some of these movements anyway, even on the leg that's not painful. All right, so you've got to hold your patient's hands. This is standardized. Hold the patient's hands, and it is... For safety's sake, but really, if Michelle's going to fall to the ground, holding her hands is really just going to be like this. Like, she's still going to be on the ground, so I'm going to be holding her hands. So, but this is standardized, the way to do it. So, stand on the, on the non-painful side, whatever that is, and we're going to do it in, in we're going to do it two different ways. The first way is with the knee straight, the second way is with the knee, is with the knee bent a little bit. In the original study, the Thessaly study, the knee bent was shown to be a much better test, but he also ran a slightly greater risk of injuring the meniscus even more. So we do it with the knee straight, and if it's just a very slight issue, then that might be negative, and then we do it with the knee bent, which is more sensitive and specific. So, knee straight, and I want you to do three twists. So I'll count one, two, three, like that. So it's three twists both sides, and that's the standard. So now we're going to do the same thing, but bend your knee a little bit more. Okay, three again. One, two, three. Good. So they got to be vigorous. They got to be twisting. Not like this. See? Like that's not doing anything to this knee. And then other patients will do this. That's <laughs> <laughs> not doing anything to the knee. So you have to be really kind of it. And unfortunately, it's happened occasionally on finals in this class. And that's another one where I just, oh, no. like, I want to, like, I think the kids nowadays are calling it face palming. <laughs> I don't want to face palm. <laughs> like that, when face that happens. Because not only are you not paying attention, but your partner's not paying attention. They're kind of screwing the test up for you. So I've seen that where it's just like that. I'm like, what, what is your patient supposed to be doing? And that's, I ask questions, heads explode. So just make sure they're always, we're twisting. This is what we're doing. We're going to do the same thing with uh, Mick Murray's a little bit and then Apley's. We're going to be essentially grinding that meniscus just like we did with the crank test, just like we did with the hip scouring. That's really important. Without doing that, it doesn't, you're not really getting the test right. And the reason this is so, this is probably such a good test is because we're using the patient's body weight and gravity and also pivoting and twisting. Things that when we do like, when we do athlete's compression and distraction, it's going to be hard to do on the patient. It's much easier to have the patient do on their own. So you hold their hands, you make sure they do three twists both sides. So one, two, three. So you're going to put in the same position, right? Not yes, foot has to be in the same position. So don't, if, they, if, if they're wearing socks, you probably want to have them put their shoes back on. Or completely barefoot. Those are, you know, the socks, if they can stick to the floor with socks on the floor. But if their foot's moving, then that's just not going to work. If they're having pain after the first twist, can you call it good or do you have them go all three times? All three times. Yeah. Do you go to bend if you get positive? Just no. straight standing. No, that would be specific. <laughs> All right, line your back. Now let me, sh let me show you McMurray's. It's a pretty good test. The stats aren't incredibly uh, good for this test, and we have two, basically two different steps here. The first step is to test the medial meniscus, and when we externally rotate the tibia, that pushes the medial meniscus anteriorly. So what we're going to do is palpate the uh, medial joint line. And by palpate, I mean palpate just like we did with Cozens and Mills and reverse codes. So we're actually putting a little bit of pressure there. And then both hands, what did I just say? Both hands rotate the tibia externally. So palpate, push in there, and then use that to, to rotate the tibia. This hand like that, this hand like this. I keep that tibia externally rotated as I extend the knee like that. Okay. And then, same palpation, just now on the lateral joint line, and both hands medially rotate the tibia. And I hold it there, and I extend. The idea is, if I, were, if I take the tibia and externally rotate it and shift the medial meniscus anteriorly, then by extending it, I'm actually pinching the anterior meniscus a little bit. And if it's irritated, that'll probably be uh, irritable. This might
might actually tell you if you have an anterior horn tear versus posterior horn tear. Posterior horn is much more um, common. So this is another one where I'm going to probably come around and have to teach you how to use your body. You have to be able to get this kind of motion in the tibia. It's really easy. You might overcomplicate it. We have to be able to both keep this rotated and palpate that joint line. If you get a good handle on the, on the ankle, that helps. And then this hand can just assist. The last meniscal test uh, is Apley's compression and distraction. The first step is compression. What you're going to do is bend the knee at about 90 degrees. And I'm going to put my hand on the, the bottom of the foot. Keep the foot in neutral as far as dorsiflexion, plantar flexion. I'm going to lean in to the tibia. And then this hand on the, on the tibia and this hand on the foot work together to grind. Leaning in, I'm grinding. Um, again, you got to be careful that you're not just doing ankle movements. The whole tibia has to be moving. And just trying to do this to the tibia is not going to do it. So it's compression of the foot, and then hold on to the tibia, and they both move the tibia together. So now let's say we did have uh, some pain there. The next test is very similar to the distraction test in the neck. If we have pain with compression in the neck or pain with compression and grinding uh, with athletes, then I can actually distract the tibia away from everything and then twist the tibia a bit. Yeah, that was more ankle because I actually slipped off the, uh, the tibia for the first uh, turn. So if we get a positive, meaning pain, with the very first motion, I don't know who stacked these. Like things. Jenga. Yeah, like Jenga. <laughs> Just like it. <laughs> Except not as fun. It makes me want to fail somebody. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, if we have a positive with the compression and grinding, that is relieved, or at least is not painful at all when we distract, then it's more likely to be meniscus. If we have positive with the compression, and also it's positive when we distract, it's probably more soft tissue. There's a ligament that attaches the meniscus to the tibia. It's called the coronary ligament. And there's a bunch of other ligaments around that area. While we, when we compress and twist the knee, those might be positive. But they would probably also be positive if we distract it and twist it as well. The meniscus won't be positive if we distract it. So Thessaly is the best meniscus test. McMurray's might tell us that the anterior part of the meniscus is irritated. And then Apley's is really just... Uh, a test that helps us differentiate between a true meniscal injury or an injury of some of the ligamentous tissue and not the meniscus. So let's go ahead and do those. 